Okay, I'm, uh, oops, uh, recording in progress. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Paul Kirby and I'm a, a staff writer reporter for the Daily Freeman and uh, we are here uh, in a, uh, another debate that we are sponsoring uh, here at the Daily Freeman. We've had a couple already, they, they've come out pretty good so far. Uh, this one will uh, feature uh, Senator Michelle Hinchy of uh, Saugerties and Senator Sue Serino of Hyde Park. So uh, thank you guys for uh, showing up. Appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, we're going to um, we're going to start out with the opening statements. Avon Lahara, by the way, is here, too. He's our senior editor here at the uh, Daily Freeman Hill. Uh, uh, be timing uh, 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 answers, plus he'll pop in every so often uh, with a question. So anyway, um, we are uh, going to start out with uh, uh, opening statements, and they're going to be, I think we sent you guys a, a, a thing, a uh, 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 format. Uh, so they'll be like three, three minutes long, the opening statements, and then we'll go to questions, and they'll be about, I don't know, there's maybe- Two eight, minutes. There's two minutes, for, yeah, two minutes for, yeah, two minutes for questions. Two minutes for questions. Uh, we will have if there is a rebuttal, there will be one minute, and each one gets uh, one rebuttal, and then we'll move on to the next question, just so we can keep it going. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're going to start out. We doing this in alphabetical order. So Senator Hinchy, uh, you will go first with the opening uh, uh, statement, and then Senator Serino will go first uh, with the closing one, which is. Is that three minutes long too? That's three minutes. Two long. minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, all right, Senator Hinchy, go uh, go right ahead. Uh, you got three minutes. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and first and foremost, to the Daily Freeman, uh, to Paul and Yvonne, thank you so much for hosting us today and for holding this forum. Uh, it's really important to be engaged uh, in public service and in government and politics. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Senator Michelle Hinchy. I am born and raised right here in Saugerties, and I first ran for office to help my community. I went to Saugerties High School, which is a public school, and I graduated from the Industrial and Labor Relations School at Cornell right into the middle of the last recession in 2009. And so I know personally the type of uneasiness and uncertainty that especially young people are feeling right now across all of our communities. Uh, I also saw firsthand how public service is supposed to work, how when you bring people together and you have the tough conversations and you do the work, you can make real positive change for our communities. And that's why I ran for office. And when I ran in uh, 2020, I promised that I would be an effective legislator and that I would really fight for our upstate communities. And I'm really proud that over the last two years of my term, I've been able to do just that. We passed 53 bills through the legislature, uh, all of them but one with wide bipartisan support, some of them even unanimously making me the most effective legislat legislator in the legislature. Uh, we passed the most bills of any senator uh, and any legislator. And all of those bills have to deal with real issues that we are facing here in the Hudson Valley. One of them expanded broadband service, making it easier to build out internet. And there are people here in Ulster County who now have internet for the first time because of our legislation. Uh, we also passed legislation to expand healthcare services. And we know that we are losing our healthcare services in our upstate communities. Uh, what feels like by the day, we expanded access and made certain uh, healthcare services easier, including for our first responders to be able to deliver the life-saving care that they want to. Uh, we've also protected a person's right to choose, making sure that uh, medical providers are not penalized, they do not face adverse action if they perform an abortion on someone who comes from an anti-abortion state here into New York. They now cannot be penalized for doing their jobs, and that's legislation that I was really proud to sponsor. We've also been really focused in our communities, holding over 50 community events like hygiene drives, clothing drives, food drives to give back to our community and help the people who need it most, and we've held over 75 mobile office hours bringing constituent services into our rural areas so that people can actually work with 
with government and get the services that they are owed uh, from New York State. So I've been really proud of the work that we've been able to deliver here for the Hudson Valley, and I'm excited to be able to continue that work uh, into next session. Thank you okay. for having us. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Senator Torino, you're up. Okay, thank you, Paul. And I first I'd like to say thank you for Michelle for being here with us today. And of course, Paul, to you and the Daily Freeman for hosting this and, and really all that you do really to keep our community connected. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Senator Sue Serino, and I've been so proud to have the opportunity to serve the current 41st State Senate District uh, since 2015, which covered most of Dutchess and part of Putnam County. And you know, for most of my life, I was too busy working two and three jobs to keep the bills paid. And I never really saw or paid attention to politics because I didn't see what role it would play until it didn't. You know, I was a single mom for a good portion of my life, living paycheck to paycheck. And I know that so many people are experiencing that right now. I actually opened a childcare business to stay home with my son during the day and then waitressed at night uh, to pay the bills. Uh, later on, I opened up a small business, a real estate business, and I really <laughs> firsthand got to see how red tape at its worst. And I knew I had to get involved if I really wanted to make a difference. So I ran for the town board uh, where I learned early the importance of govern by, governing by listening. And you'll hear me uh, often say that when I found myself having to go against my own party to do right by our neighbors. I then ran for the Dutchess County Legislature where I had this same experience and I had to stand up against my own party who was trying to implement an energy tax at a time when our neighbors absolutely could not afford it. And then the Senate asked me to run and I saw it as a wonderful opportunity to help even more people. When people tell me that they're struggling, I truly get it because I've lived it. You know, it's that life experience I think that sets me apart and drives me to always do right by our neighbors. Uh, since taking office, we've had some major wins for the local community, but over the past few years, that progress has been derailed by one party control, and that's drowning out our voices and raising costs for everything from gas to groceries, prescription drugs, utility bills, and so much more. Our neighbors are desperate for relief right now, and that's why I'm in this race, to ensure that they have a strong, independent voice on their side. I look forward to taking your questions here today and to share my vision for a brighter, more affordable future for our neighbors. Okay, great. Um, and I did, uh, I meant to mention one thing in the beginning is that this is a unique race and that uh, I guess the redistricting uh, caused a uh, uh, sort of incumbent against the incumbent. So uh, that is unique uh, for our area. Uh, I meant to mention that uh, in the beginning, but okay, we'll start out. Uh, you both mentioned local kind of issues. Uh, Senator Serino in passing, you mentioned utility bills. Uh, Central Hudson uh, is uh, right on the front and center of most of uh, the uh, people's minds in our uh, particular coverage areas. We hear it all the time. When we put stories in, it is the top red thing uh, every single time. Uh, so there is concern about these bills. And I know that, uh, that uh, both of you and other uh, lawmakers have uh, you know, written letters uh, to the Public Service Commission to Central Hudson itself, you know, urging that they uh, you know, they stopped this, that, uh, that, you know, they stopped the bills, they stopped the fees, they stopped, but on and on it goes. For the past, uh, uh, bills uh, are expected or have quadrupled in four months. Uh, well, the kilowatt charge per, per hour, you guys probably see it in your own bills. I know I do in mine. Anyway, so despite, you know, you guys advocating on behalf of uh, customers and all their utility, uh, continues to do what it does. And it doesn't seem to be uh, 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 an end in sight. I mean, that they even admit that this is going to go on uh, through the winter. So I guess my question to both of you is, can lawmakers really make a difference at all uh, in this, in, 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 stopping these, uh, in stopping these higher, uh, higher utility bills, higher essential housing bills for customers in your district? Okay. We're gonna go with uh, Senator Serino. You can start out on this one and then we'll follow up with uh, 
Senator Henchy. Go ahead. Yeah, and I don't think anyone has been a more a vocal voice for our constituents about these uh, increased prices than I have. I've been one of the first legislators actually to call on the PSC to do an investigation. Our office has continually continuously help so many people with their bills. Um, you know, we feel like we have a separate department to uh, help our constituents with the services. And, you know, as someone that is the ranker on the uh, Senate's Aging Commission, I am committed to keeping our utility costs down. Uh, Albany's supermajority, on the other hand, is um, working to decommission power plants. And when you think about that, think about Indian Point it was one of the cleanest energy sources that we had and 25% of that power went to New York City. And now we're not going to have that. So I think that's so important that, you know, you can't, you have to have competition. And I don't think anything is going to change until we have increased energy supply. And we don't have that right now. And you can't have, you have to have competition. If you only have one source of energy, look what's gonna happen. It's terrible for our constituents and so many people. It's not just seniors that are suffering right now. I'm hearing from young families too that cannot afford to live here can, and are making choices between paying for uh, food, fuel, gas. It's all hitting them all at once. And can you imagine how bad it's gonna be this uh, winter, uh, when uh, everything, when the winter hits, it's going to be even worse. And at uh, Enchi, go ahead. Thank you. I, thank you. Um, I appreciate my opponent talking about uh, seniors and the impact that this, uh, that these increased rates are having on seniors, because one of the top bills for the AARP is a bill that would create a consumer advocate to be a watchdog over these utility companies. And it's a bill that my opponent actually voted against twice uh, and a bill that I voted for. Uh, we've been advocating, myself and my office have been advocating against Central Hudson uh, for what feels like an eternity. Earlier this year, I questioned the chairman of the PSC on March 6th at a budget hearing asking uh, the PSC to open an investigation into Central Hudson and their estimated billing practices, really a billing scheme. Uh, on March 9th, the PSC opened that investigation and that is underway currently. Uh, we are now reaching out to the PSC asking when we are going to find the outcomes of that investigation because it cannot go on any longer. We need an answer. We've led numerous letters on uh, to Central Hudson and to the PSC both about lowering their rates, holding their rates, not being able to increase costs for ratepayers across our community. And we actually hosted a forum with County Executive Ryan at the time and Assemblyman Cahill, allowing hundreds of people to testify on the record uh, about their Central Hudson bills and their utility bills that we then delivered to the PSC to take into account. It's also my legislation that bans the practice of estimated billing. Uh, this is something that we heard from the Human Rights Commissioner here in Ulster County, an example of how we work together. They reached out to us a year ago about something weird going on with people's bills. We looked into it and we wrote the bill to ban estimated billing, and I'm incredibly proud of that. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out, too, is I don't take any money from utility companies. My opponent does. She has taken thousands of dollars from Central Hudson, and we've called on uh, her to return them, and she has it. Uh, so we are fighting back really hard against Central Hudson. We have to hold them accountable, and that legislation for estimated okay. billing is a priority of mine next year. All right, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Serino, do you want to... Uh rebut any of that. Uh, yes, and actually that's a dupli duplicative um, duplicative position that you're talking about, and it would just increase cost. In fact, there was a Democrat that voted against it. And the donation that I took, I actually gave to a local charity because I have been fighting with Central Hudson and sticking up for our constituents. And to tell you the truth, if Senator Henshi wants to talk about being in influenced by a do donation though, I think our de neighbors deserve an answer for an explanation for the thousands of dollars in donations from New York City special interests that have abandoned our upstate community by voting with her New York City party bosses 99, I think 99.1% of the time. All right, Senator Henchy, I suppose there's a rebuttal in there to that too. Sure, I would be curious what special interest you're talking about. That sounds like a talking point as opposed to any actual facts, but uh, I've been a huge voice for our upstate communities. It's why we've been able to 
uh, expand things like broadband, why we're pushing back on Central Hudson, why we've held the first ever bipartisan water infrastructure hearing to actually change how we fund water infrastructure for our municipalities. Uh, it was also uh, me who led the charge to expand how we funded our CHIPS funding, which is road infrastructure, educating my downstate colleagues on why that is so important. And because of that, we were able to get an extra $100 million in CHIPS funding, which is jobs for our upstate and rural communities, safety for our neighbors, and really important climate resiliency actions that we've taken. So I could spend the next hour talking about how we fought for Upstate and uh, the things that we've delivered, but I'm sure we'll get into that more. Yes. Uh, but a, a lack of uh, specifics and talking points is, okay. uh, well, I think, something we're going to hear a lot more of. Okay, good. We're going to go on, though, because we only got an hour. Uh, the um, and, and this follows the Central Hudson thing, and, and it, it, will be, it will be the last one on Central Hudson. I just we just get so many calls about it. Uh, but the state has an ambitious climate change action plan uh, in place whereby residents may have to change uh, their heating systems eventually uh, to different types, including electric. Um, but uh, both of you are just critical of uh, Central Hudson. Uh, and this uh, kind of thing seems to benefit the company. Uh, and isn't there a risk that this will create higher prices. Senator Hinchy, you can go. Sure. The climate crisis is real and we have to do everything we can to combat that. And a big part of that is getting off of fossil fuels. We've actually seen that it's cheaper. Businesses and residential uh, homes that are uh, running on electric uh, electricity, specifically and renewable energy, it's actually cheaper. So it lowers bills uh, entirely. We're also then less connected to a global oil market, uh, which we don't have any control over. Uh, but we will have control if we have homegrown energy from solar and wind and other, uh, other options, we'll be able to control that. And so what we're seeing is that it's actually lowering bills, it's decreasing costs, and it's better for, uh, better for everyone. We need to make sure that we're rolling that out in a way that that makes that really works for all of our communities, especially in upstate. Uh, but actually, being on uh, renewable energy is cheaper. It's proven to be cheaper. Senator Serino. You know, Paul, you hit the nail right on the head. And that's why when this bill came around, I had questions about it. I asked about having a cost analysis because they couldn't tell me how much it was going to cost and a grid reliability study. Think about that because we need that grid reliability if you have one source. Uh, my opponent uh, supported uh, the All Electric Utilities Act, which would cost, I think, homeowners an additional $20,000. When I talk to seniors, they can't afford the, the increases in their gas and their and fuel oil right now. Now you're going to have one source of, of electric or one source of energy, what are they going to do? We've already seen what's happened with Central Hudson. I can't even imagine what the bills are going to be. I myself have a heat pump, right? So that's supposed to be a little bit more energy efficient. My bill was $900 for a month. You know, I'm in a position where, you know, we both work and we can pay for it. I'm not a senior living on a fixed income, but you can't do this. You know, this bill was so broad that for, I can't even imagine homeowners having to pay, replace their furnace they're electric, you know, and independent organizations have already said that this will increase taxes and utility bills are going to go through the roof, something that we're already seeing. So how do you do that? We're, we don't know what the future holds right now. We're the, with inflation. They're talking about a recession. I just, I think this is absolutely terrible. Uh, Senator Henchy, you want to, uh, you back? Sure. Um, again, I'd love to know what organization that is that, that my opponent is citing, but uh, we, uh, we know that it's, it's cheaper, right? We actually know there are businesses that have been completely built now from the ground up on renewables, and we have to make sure that we are making changes. Uh, our planet is not, it's not sustainable in the way that we are working, uh, that our energy system is working now. It's not sustainable. I personally would like to have a planet for my future kids to live on. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we are switching to renewable energy. It's smart, it's efficient. Uh, and again, we know that our bills 
actually go down when we remove ourselves from being dependent on uh, groups like OPEC and uh, traditional dirty fossil fuels. Uh, it's the way that we have to go. We're doing it in a responsible way. And we're really, uh, really proud that we actually here in New York are leading the way to make sure that show you can do it. We have some businesses here in Ulster County uh, that have completely changed their uh, structure, their infrastructure to run solely on renewables and they're saving money because they're doing it right. And that's what we want to incentivize, incentivize and support here in the state. Okay. And we Senator want, Serena. Yeah, we want renewables energies. It makes sense, but it has to be a smart plan. There was no plan in place. It was a soundbite. And to do this on the backs of people that are struggling right now is like a slap in the face. How are these families going to be able to afford this, Paul? I just, I don't know. I think it's terrible. Okay, we're going to go to another one. Uh, and thanks for that uh, lively conversation. Um, we'll go on to another topic uh, that's getting quite uh, attention these days. There is a, a second vote uh, coming up uh, by the legislature to codify abortion in the state constitution. Uh, and uh, Senator Serino, uh, you had voted in favor of doing that uh, the first time around, but did vote against adopting the Reproductive Health, Ca uh, Health Act in 2020, I believe, right? Yes. Um, so Senator, I guess the question is, uh, how, how uh, will you vote uh, uh, when uh, issue to codify the uh, uh, abortion in the state constitution comes about uh, pretty soon, I, I think the next session. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, go ahead. Yes, you know, Paul, my opponent uh, wants to tell you uh, what my stance is, but when it comes to reproductive health care, no one should speak about a woman. So I want to tell you what my stance is. I did vote for the um, Equal Amendments Bill, and I will the bill is the same, I will vote for it again because I believe that this should go out to the public. This is such a sensitive issue on both sides, no matter who you talk to. And I'm having a lot of conversations with a lot of people, women and men. Um, my son was born five and a half weeks early and I almost lost him twice. So I voted no for that Reproductive Health Care Act that would allow abortions in the ninth month with non-doctors performing them. And I have to tell you that public opinion, I think it's over 75, 80% that the public agrees that that was not a good bill. Okay, Senator Hinchy, you were, I believe, four square behind all of this, uh, uh, including the uh, Reproductive Health Act and, uh, and to codify uh, the abortion in the state uh, constitution. Um, how will you, uh, uh, if this comes up for a second time, uh, vote on this matter and in response to what Senator Serino said? Sure, thank you. No, absolutely. Uh, I was actually a leading voice saying that we had to vote on and pass the Equal Rights Amendment uh, this year in the extraordinary session after the uh, absolute travesty that was the overturning of uh, Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision. Uh, it is a travesty. Uh, and I Choice is a personal choice. The right to an abortion, the right to reproduct, uh, reproductive health care should be everyone's personal decision, which is why having the right to an abortion and the Reproductive Health Act was a critical piece of legislation that my colleagues passed. And I want to be clear, if we did not have the Reproductive Health Act and the protections right now in New York State because of that bill, Every single woman, every single person seeking reproductive health care after that decision would have been on the chopping block. We would not have protected rights if it were not for the Reproductive Health Act. Um, it is, I want to push back on one thing too. Uh, no one is, the abortions in the ninth month is a fear mongering talking point. Uh, let's be clear. The only time that anyone is having a later term abortion is if someone's life is in jeopardy uh, or there are extreme extenuating circumstances. It is trying to put people against each other as opposed to just recognizing that a woman or a person's healthcare decisions are no one else's, but theirs, their family and their doctor. And so I'm incredibly proud that my colleagues passed the Reproductive Health Act. I'm incredibly proud to have pushed for the Equal 
rights amendment and to have been a leading voice to make sure we got that done uh, in one session. We have to pass it in the next session and then it goes to voters that's a long time if we didn't have the reproductive health act today we would all be without our rights here in the state of new york uh, and so uh, really uh, just, proud, to follow, uh, just to follow up senator Hinchy, is there a limit that you think that i mean is it a limit uh, for you in your opinion to, to, of a time when it, an abortion can take place it's the let's take a step back and i think we've, we've all heard this conversation before but we should take a step yeah. back if someone is having an abortion later on in their term, something horrendous is happening. They probably already have a nursery. They probably have a name picked out. They have clothes. They're ready. Their family, if they've told their friends and family, they have told their community, they are bringing a child into this world to start a family. If they then have to make a horrible, horrible gut-wrenching choice based on, maybe it's the, the woman's life that's in danger, maybe it's the baby's life that's in danger, maybe it's both. Uh, that is a decision, that is a healthcare decision. That is a decision that needs to be made between the person carrying the child and their doctor. People aren't using abortion as uh, contraception, right? That is not happening. So when we fear monger and talk about late term abortions and we talk about, you know, the, the challenges families, that is meant to distract us from okay. it being a fundamental right to make a health care choice because reproductive care is health care and health care is a human right. OK, Senator Serino, go ahead. You want to sure. rebut any of that? Yes. And you know what? The Democrats are doing a really good job about you know, fear mongering right now because nothing changes in New York. Nothing. Everything stays the same. So thank you, Paul. Okay. Because of the Reproductive Health Act that you did not vote for. That's why it stays no, the same. That is not true. Okay. We're going to go on to some, uh, another one. Um, and I think you both know about this uh, uh, or, or know the specifics, so I won't. Uh, delve into them, but uh, some communities in our area are debating on whether or not to pass local laws known as good cause eviction. Uh, uh, Kingston, for one, uh, has gone and done it. Uh, but the other communities say that they're a little bit afraid of passing such legislation because, um, you know, they're afraid of getting sued uh, and they don't have so much money. Uh, unlike the state, however, and some activists have said that uh, that that the New York state should pass such a law uh, so that all communities uh, have this in place, the good, uh, good cause uh, uh, eviction law, which I guess was kind of rumbling around in the legislature uh, last year and this year, but never really uh, got to the floor. Senator Hinchy, uh, I know that you've been pressed by uh, aggressively at times uh, by uh, activist groups uh, to get this law going uh, uh, in the legislature. So what do you think now? Thank you. Yes, I have. Uh, and I respect their energy and I, I respect uh, the efforts that they're putting behind because housing uh, needs to be a right. You know, nothing. If you don't have a stable home, it's really difficult to get any other part of your life on track. And so just first and foremost, I absolutely agree that no one should be evicted because of bad code enforcement uh, for reporting bad living conditions and no one should have their rent increased astronomically. Uh, we have to make sure people can afford to live here. Uh, that's a, a major issue uh, that we are facing. Uh, Housing across our state is very different. Housing in every community is really different. Housing in the city of Kingston is different from the city of New Paltz, is different from housing in Shan or the town of New Paltz, is different from housing in Shandaken. Uh, and so I've always said that uh, communities that wanna pass good cause locally, I support that. Um, at the state level, it's still something that we're looking at, but to make sure that we're doing it in a way that makes sense. Uh, and also uh, with good cause, if you pass uh, that without short-term rental regulations, then you're encouraging uh, all, uh, all owners, local owners, and others to shift into short-term rentals. We have a short-term rental crisis. And to be clear, a lot of our short-term rentals is how our community survived the pandemic, right? That's how our restaurants right. stayed afloat. That's how our main street stayed, uh, uh, stayed afloat, how our small businesses stayed in business. But at the same time, it's strangling our housing market and it's strangling our communities. And so I actually carried the legislation 
which puts some regulations on short-term rentals. It creates a statewide registry. It has more data sharing. It has better uh, enforcement mechanisms for uh, our local, uh, for law enforcement and our municipalities. And then that will give our municipalities the information that they need to either cap short-term rentals or do whatever it is that they need to do specifically for the housing in their communities. Uh, and so we have to make sure that we have a housing market that works for everybody. And I think all of these pieces have to come together to create a holistic housing solution. Okay, Senator Serino, um, yes. a good cause eviction. Where do you where, where are you on that? You know, everybody should have affordable housing, Paul. That's so important. And when I think this is a bill that I would not support, I think about our mom and pops, right, that have uh, apartments maybe where it's paying for their retirement or it's paying for their uh, children's college education. Those things have to be taken into consideration. And this, again, is big government controlling what we're doing with our properties and our lives. And people are sick and tired of that. We don't need more government. And we need to be able to, especially like the COVID pandemic taught us, like people need to be able to have these supplemental things coming in and uh, and we need to afford actually increase affordable housing. When you talk about that right from the beginning, that's someplace that we need to concentrate on too. Right. The, the argument, uh, Senator, will be that um, you know, there are landlords out there who are uh, taking advantage of a situation right now. I mean, we hear it all the time. People's rents uh, climbing $200 a month just uh, when their leases end or in the middle of leases uh, that, uh, you know, $300, $400 a month uh, sometime. And so, you know, eventually, uh, right, maybe government has to step in and say, that, that's enough. What do you think? You know what? There's bad actors everywhere, right? And the bad actors need to be held accountable, but you're going to penalize all of the good people that have the best of intentions. And that's what's more typical than not with these properties. And I just, I do not believe in the good cause eviction policy. Oh, okay. Senator Hinchy, you want to say anything about that? Follow that up or... Yes, please. Uh, we absolutely need more affordable workforce and supportive housing in our communities. And I actually led the charge to create that. Most people don't think about a housing crisis in our rural and upstate communities, but we are living it. I'm a state senator. I can't afford to buy a home here. It's a personal issue uh, for me and my friends and my community. And so my office and myself, we led the largest single investment in uh, upstate housing our state has ever had this year in the budget. We secured funding to build more affordable housing, like small rental development units, because uh, most of the government support for building housing goes to huge, uh, big, you know, thousand unit buildings. We can't sustain that with our crumbling infrastructure and our limited infrastructure, our water infrastructure. So the small rental development initiative, first time we've ever funded it in the budget, ever funded it period, actually builds uh, unit, uh, buildings of 20 units or less uh, that will be affordable in our communities. And it was actually me and my office that fought to create uh, expand the Housing Our Neighbors okay. with Dignity Act. Really yeah, just to follow, just, but just to follow that up, we were having a story this coming weekend that in Kingston and the town of Ulster, uh, together, there's a total of 1,100 units proposed uh, in various projects. One in Midtown announced the other day, uh, one at the IBM uh, 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 site, like 500 units, uh, one uh, 63 units. Uh, I mean, the, these projects that are currently proposed and underway, uh, you know, are not just the 20 unit buildings. Oh, these totally, are big totally. ones. Totally. There's, and then it's all part of it, right? But we have to make sure that we're also building smaller units. But I will say, thank you for bringing that up, because that's exactly what I was just about to talk about. Uh, the Housing Our Neighbors with Dignity Act was a bill that was uh, to convert hotels and motels into affordable and supportive housing. That originated as just a New York City specific bill. And I actually led the charge to make that a statewide bill, because that is huge for our communities and really important. I also led the charge to make sure that the $100 million that was allocated to that bill became statewide funding not just New York City specific funding. We were successful this year. And that's actually the funding that Repco is using for the quality in project that's coming to Ulster. So right. that's upstate uh, advocating in real time, making sure that housing is being solved here in our communities and we'll be continuing. And to it is Serena, do you think the legislature controlled by the Democrats is doing enough? 
as 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 Senator Hinchy seems to be saying. Doing a lot. We're never doing. We have a lot more to do. I don't want to make it seem like we're doing enough. We yeah, but do. Senator Serena, what do it's, you think? It's because of Albany's bad policies that we are having a struggle with having affordable housing. And I can tell you, for a situation in my district, I have a builder that was building a senior affordable housing in Fishkill, and before he even puts a shovel in the ground, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to even start. And then now because of a blanding turtle and we're all very conscientious about the environment, but it's a difference between 80 and 100 feet this um, development is tied up for months and months and months and more money that this developer has to spend, which you know has to will trickle down or to the um, person that's gonna live there or eliminate this project from even happening. Those are the kind of things that we have to concentrate on is trying to help people be able to build afford, true affordable housing. Okay. Can I ask a quick question? What? The, the Democrats have only been in the majority since 2019 in the right. Senate in our house. So I would just be mm -hmm. curious what the Republicans or you personally did to build affordable housing and make it easier to actually have more affordable housing when you were in the majority. Because we've okay. only had it since 2019. Okay, so Senator Serino. The costs have skyrocketed since you guys have been in the majority. It's the it's spend and tax is what people are calling it, what we see. That's not good for our economies. It's hurting people. That's not specific, but okay. All right, so we're going to go on. Uh, but housing is a big one. We hear about that almost as much as Central Hudson. Um, anyway, what, uh, what, 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 let's talk about this. This has been an ongoing thing, and, and, uh, but it is one of the big, uh, uh, big topics up in, uh, up in Albany and here around the nation for that matter. And that is bail reform and uh, how each of you think that that is going. Some legislators, say it is working just fine. And others say it should be entirely repealed. Okay, so uh, Senators, who spoke last? I said, Senator Serino, go ahead, bail reform. Yes, um, thank you very much, Paul. And you know, bail reform started with the best of intentions, right? If somebody didn't have the means to um, pay for bail on a low level offense, by all means, right? They should be allowed that, but it went way too far. And in fact, early on, I had uh, heard from domestic violence advocates, DAs, law enforcement about loopholes because of domestic violence and how dangerous this bill was going to be. And we convened a meeting to let the, let the people know, let the uh, majority know, and nothing has been done. This is so dangerous. And you read in the paper every single day about crimes that are happening all over and repeat offenders. We need to have dangerousness considered for the judges because they are seeing the people come back time and time again. And because we're all reading about it, right? You see it all over the place. In fact, New York City, you have a uh, Democratic uh, Mayor Eric Adams has come out and said, we have to change bail reform. The DA in Albany, and we also have um, Robert Duffy that just came out also uh, to say that we've got to repeal bail reform and we need to repeal it. It needs to have the stakeholders at the table, the people that actually have skin in the game to be able to go back and do the right thing because their number one job should be protecting our constituents. And right now they don't feel safe. Okay, Senator Angie. Thank you. Yeah, what we're talking about is safety, right? And having people in our communities feel safe, uh, which is why we led the charge and voted to fully fund our law enforcement departments and our local police departments. Uh, it's why we funded in the first ever interstate task force to actually take illegal guns off our street and to create a division within the state police to actually monitor illegal guns. We also made sure that 3D guns, ghost guns, are illegal. Uh, just a couple months ago, you could 3D print your own lethal gun and that was fine. That is now illegal because it's re uh, we have to crack 
contract out and make sure that people are safe. We've also delivered, I have delivered uh, increased funding uh, to places like the city of Kingston for anti-violence initiatives, anti-gun uh, prevention programs, uh, making sure that there's after school activities and a host of things uh, to make sure that our communities are really on, uh, are really safe and that those on the front lines are have the resources they need uh, to keep our communities safe. Uh, you know, one of the things too, I think this earlier this year, uh, there were amendments made to bail reform. Repeat offenders are now bail eligible. Illegal gun or any gun crimes are now bail eligible. And so that is something that exists today. If the court system or the DAs are not charging uh, the way that they could be or should be, uh, and the court system doesn't understand, we have a study right now going on to make sure the court system is actually doing their jobs and being held accountable to implement the legislation uh, that is that exists. Uh, so to fear monger and say kind of the talking points about repeat offenders and all these things, that is now part of the legislation that was uh, created earlier this year in the budget. So there have been amendments made. Uh, and also we know, if I encourage people, if you read the Times Union or the Buffalo News, even Newsday, the Long Island paper have all done their own studies on uh, is increasing crime relevant to bail reform? And they all say, no, I encourage people to read those studies. But I want to say one thing too. I have the endorsement uh, from Sheriff Juan Figueroa, from the troopers yeah. and from the uh, PBA of New York State because they know okay. that I am working in partnership with all of them to keep our community safe. Okay, Senator, Senator Serino, you want to uh, weigh in on any of that? Yes, and that is delusional about more funding. The DAs are begging for dollars. They're begging for the money to be able to do their job. I talked to our local sheriff who has eight more uh, sheriffs that are working on uh, the information that they need for discovery, taking them off of the street. So their hands are tied right now. And every single paper, and I know that I read, and I know if I hear from my uh, friends, family, people when I'm out on the street, people uh, just had a call today that somebody said, you know what, this bail reform has got to be repealed. Repealed. It is so dangerous. And the little tweaks that were made were good talking points, but they didn't do the job. They have not protected the public. And if you're reading the paper every day, you'll see how dangerous that law is. I, you both talked about, you know, uh, you know uh, or, or Senator Serena more than Senator Hinchy about, you know, the crime in New York and stuff. But in your districts, in the district that you're running for, you know, has bail reform been a good thing or a bad thing? In, it, in that in the district. Yes, it's a bad thing. I'm talking to law okay. enforcement and they're telling me how they have to. It's like catch and release. And the criminals realize, Paul, there's no consequences for their bad behavior. So that's happening again and again. And it's really it's scary when you think about it. And like I said before, our number one job is to protect our constituents. And that job is not being done again. You can't have one party control in Albany. You have to have checks and balances. And right now we don't have it and the public is paying the price. Senator Henchy. Yeah, it's just, I mean, a lot of that just isn't, isn't true. Uh, in our communities and in the changes that were made, they are not talking points. They are real substantive talking points. And I'm not sure, I mean, maybe Serena, you haven't, or my colleague hasn't read it. Uh, but if you do, uh, you would see that they're actually big changes. And when I talk to uh, my law enforcement counterparts, again, all of those that have endorsed me for reelection in this, for this seat, uh, know that we're working with them to give them the tools they need, the resources they need, and to uh, keep our community safe. It's Okay. That we do that. And in our communities, uh, it's most of the crime that we're seeing are illegal gun crimes, which is what we're cracking down and doing as much as we possibly can to make sure that illegal guns are not proliferating in our streets and we're keeping our kids safe. We'll get to guns. Uh, but uh, we're going to go on to something else. Another topic that has uh, gotten a whole lot of attention uh, during the past few years, and that is the legalization of recreational uh, marijuana use and sale. Uh, and now the state, a panel, uh, uh, is uh, dealing with the uh, with the dispense dispensaries uh, and uh, coming up with rules to, to set them up. That hasn't been done yet, uh, but they're uh, still working it. Um, so I'm wondering from each of you, are you concerned about any societal impacts or law enforcement issues that might come up? with legalized recreational marijuana use and sale. Once it gets going, uh, people can walk into their neighborhood store and buy weed. 
what do you think? Tenor Hinchi. Tenor Hinchi. Yeah. Sure. Um, to, to clarify, it's not going to be in like all neighborhood stores, right? They are licensed dispensaries and towns uh, can opt out of it if they want to. We're seeing even towns uh, in the most conservative parts uh, of our district that opted out first are opting in now uh, because there, uh, there's a lot of guidelines, there's a lot of regulations, and we know that this is going to be tremendously beneficial for uh taxpayers. Uh, it's a huge uh, an agricultural uh, commodity. As chair of the Agriculture Committee, this is a boon for our farmers. Uh, we have to do everything we can to support them, and this is going to be tremendously helpful. And so we have funding for law enforcement. We've been working with our local uh, chiefs and police departments to make sure that their, their questions are answered. Any concerns they have, they can call us. Again, we, we've had many conversations with them. They know how to find me. Uh, but this is something that you know, we've been behind the times uh, a bit in this area. I was proud to vote for the MRTA and work in partnership with our communities to make sure that the rollout is right. And we have uh, here in Ulster County, Jen Metzger is on the Cannabis Control Board. And so uh, we've got a lot of local input too into how this is rolling out. Uh, Senator Serino, uh, go ahead. It's going to cause problems or not? Uh, thank you, Paul. You know, when, when conversations had first come up about this, I had teachers calling me, parents, law enforcement, um, people that uh, whose children had been, um, you know, addicted to drugs. So I heard from so many people and they were very fearful about this happening. They did not want to see it. And here we go again criminals first, because if you're a criminal, you go to the top of the line to open up that dispensary ahead of everybody else. That is the whole mindset of New York. And, you know, um, when you talk about you talk about farmers and helping the farmers, the farm wage board just is. We'll, like we'll get to that. We'll get to okay. that, Senator. Continue with the. The marijuana. We'll get to the farm. Yeah, no, but I. That's why I am not in support of that, and um, because I do, you know, Paul, you heard me say I govern by yes. listening, and I'm hearing from these families and law enforcement. They don't know how they'll enforce this. There's just so much to it that they're nervous about it, and rightfully so. Okay, Senator Enchi, anything there you want to weigh in on? Sure. It's social equity applicants uh, that are getting the first pass. Those are veterans. Those are women-owned businesses. Those are minority-owned businesses. Those are disadvantaged farmers that are getting those first licenses. Many of those farmers uh, got crushed by bad hemp policies from our previous governor. Uh, this is now allowing them to stay in business. It's the our hemp farmers who are getting some of these first licenses. So the people who are being brought to the front of the line are social equity applicants, uh, people who uh, we can really serve uh, in our communities and who will be better off to now start their own business, right? Be part of the American American dream to actually be able to afford uh, to have a family, to be able to afford to live in our communities. Uh, this is something it's it's great for the for our economy. It's great for the bottom line. We're working with our law enforcement to ensure uh, any questions or challenges that they have that can be addressed. Uh, but the legalization of cannabis is something that has been in the works. Okay, for Senator Serino, uh, you want to go ahead, oh. Yvonne. Well, I, I just wanted to, to bring up something that's been happening in this is in the business of, of the cannabis uh, situation where there are, there's this thing called vert vertical integration, right? Where like one business can do all the steps and there's some uh, and the state has basically separated them so that there's enough competition and people can do. But now you have all these businesses uh, like Etain locally that was purchased by a larger company. Uh, so the idea that these small businesses were being allowed to to do this the vertical integration that they could do the whole thing is kind of like seems like it's going a little bit out the window because there you have these large companies coming in and doing this you know it's kind of like almost like an amazon of weed which was what what the whole the idea of preventing this from happening right a, a big large company just coming in and and think what, what can the state do about this senator Hinchy. i can take that um oh. That's uh, that's why we need the Cannabis Control Board to really be looking at that, right? That's now an entire agency dedicated to overseeing the rollout of the MRTA, dedicated to overseeing the licenses, and then ensuring that the way that we wrote the MRTA is actually implemented. Uh, and so I actually just signed on to a letter that was led by Senator Rachel May asking for more transparency from the Cannabis Control Board, both in understanding their timeline for dispensaries uh, and what their plans are moving forward. But that would be something that falls directly into that for us to be able to see 
see uh, how they plan to address that because you're exactly right. We were this legislation was written with the absolute intention for small businesses to run this market, not to have big corporations from Massachusetts or Colorado uh, or Oregon or you name it to come in uh, and control it. This is a uh, really starting an industry for people who both have been uh, criminalized and their lives turned up are upended because of antiquated uh, marijuana laws and also so that uh, small independent businesses can really run the market. Okay, Senator Serino, go, uh, what do you think? Do you think that uh, the state is really acting in the best interest of small business? Absolutely not. You know, this is, and Ivan, you were right, this is Albany dysfunction at its worst. You know, it's taking so long for all of this to happen, too, that these companies are going to other states and they're collecting the taxes and we don't need another agency. You know, it's like agency upon agency upon agency. It just, it's, it's terrible and it's uh, not working. Okay. And, and once again, I just want to add that criminals yeah. at the top of the list. So that's the way New York is going. If you're a criminal, you love to live here. Okay. Uh, we're going to go on to something else that you both mentioned, and that is uh, farms uh, in uh, in New York State uh, uh, and in uh, and in your districts uh, district. Uh, uh, farm workers in uh, New York will apparently eventually uh, qualify for overtime pay. Uh, after working 40 hours uh, in a week under a new rule that uh, was announced by, uh, by the Labor Commissioner, I guess, just last week. Uh, but the uh, total overtime matter won't be uh, fully implemented uh, until 10 years from now. Uh, and we're just wondering what, uh, what your position, uh, both uh, are on this. I, Senator Hinchy, I know that the Democratic majority has, you know, supported uh, 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 in, increasing this overtime uh, thing, but you know, ten years is a long time to wait. Uh, but uh, go ahead. What do you think? Sure. So the first, uh, the legislation to create the wage board was before my time, uh, before I was elected. But yes. I requested to chair the agriculture committee when I was elected because this is a critically important industry. And uh, in the last two years, as I said, we've gotten the best budget for agriculture our state's ever had uh, because we've really been able to connect the dots and elevate the importance of our local food supply. Uh, very early on in the beginning of my uh, beginning of my tenure, I was very vocal that we couldn't do anything that would negatively impact our farmers without some sort of support and some sort of help. Because if they close and they go under based on their price takers, right, they can't set their own prices. If they close, we don't have any local food. And with the climate crisis impending, New York State is going to be the biggest producer of food for our country. Uh, really important that we keep this business, uh, this industry in business. And uh, what we did in the budget, what was created in the budget this year was an overtime tax credit, a rebate that covers 118% of any additional costs, uh, labor costs allocated. It's really important that we pay people fair wages and that they have a good quality of life. It's really important that we protect our farm businesses and keep them in business. So this tax credit uh, will actually cover all of the economic impacts. Uh, and we're working at the same time over this phase in to really expand markets for our farmers, making sure that they can be as stable as possible, including a bill that I have that requires state agencies to actually purchase New York food. That creates a circular economy that keeps our tax dollars local really into our rural and upstate economies uh, and that will be a big game changer for our farm businesses okay senator serena what about this overtime thing yeah you know what the farm farmers and farm workers voices were completely ignored here and when you talk to the farm workers they come back to these farms year after year paul and it's become a family so a lot of time they have housing and and they're they have uh, eat their dinners there. So it is like a family atmosphere and they take that money back to their homes. They send their money back. They come year after year and we're going to end up losing that. 
um, they were both upset. And when you talk about the tax credit, here you go again, that's taxpayer dollars to fix a problem that the governor created. That's ridiculous. You don't do that. And you know what? My opponent has stayed silent as agricultural um, committee chair and not listening to the voices of the farmers and the farm workers. They're very afraid that they're going to have to close down. You know, they can't keep getting slammed. You got to think about it. Increased uh, costs, on, costs on gas and oil, supplies. It's been terrible for them. And this is like another slap in the face. Um, the government is overruling what they want. Uh, Senator Enchi, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I've actually been really outspoken about it. My first statement uh, that I made was on this issue back in 21, and I've made subsequent ones since then. And it was just yesterday I was at a roundtable with farmers in Columbia County listening to them, and it was my chairmanship that held the first ever listening session for farmers across our state. We did two days of listening sessions, first time that's ever happened in Albany. But what is uh, interesting to me is that my opponent represents a very agricultural-based district in Dutchess County, some of our best farms, really important farms, isn't even on the agriculture committee. Uh, it's something that I requested. It's something that we've been really elevating in our community, but all of a sudden she cares about farms now in this district because it's what we talk about, but isn't even on our committee. And uh, we've been listening to farmers. We're working with them. We uh, apps all the time, uh, spend time to make sure that their voices are heard. Uh, it's why we're supporting them in this uh, economic challenge and expanding oh. markets uh, throughout every, all the legislation that we do. All right, Senator Serino, you want to rebut that? Absolutely. I sent letters to the Department of Labor Commissioner on this. I've been talking to farmers and farm workers. And you know, you're only on so many committees, but our vote counts for all of New York State. And I know that I am being a voice for our farmers and our farm workers who don't want, didn't want this to happen. But Michelle remained quiet, and now she's having meetings afterwards, after the fact, when now this is passed. That, that is a true slap in the face to these poor farmers and farm workers that are struggling. It's not fair. All of our farmers know that I meet with them all oh, the time. So. Okay. Okay, we're getting to, uh, I see that it's about four minutes uh, to five, so that'd be four minutes to go in our... Uh, in our uh, debate, and we want to give you each a uh, two minute uh, closing remarks. So we're going to start with that, but thanks for answering those, uh, those questions. Appreciate it very much. Uh, but Senator Serino, you're going to be up first this time. Uh, so uh, go right ahead. This is a closing statement from Senator Sue Serino. Um, thank you, Paul, so much. You yeah. know, I understand the challenges that so many New Yorkers face today because I've lived them. I know what it feels like to have to decide which bills to pay and to feel like out of touch politicians are only making it worse and we're seeing it each and every day. It's really that life experience that I stop to consider before I ever vote on legislation that's gonna impact our neighbors. You know, I've been honored to serve this um, community since 2015, but I'm not a career politician. I've grown to love this job in a way that I never really thought I could because it allows me to truly help people and people need help right now more than ever. As I said before, with one party control driving people out of New York in droves, we have to bring balance back to state government and put an end to the partisan divide that's pushing people to extremes. Our neighbors need a strong independent voice that they can trust to show up and speak out on the issues that matter most. And I know we may not agree 100% of the time, but I have a proven record of being that voice. And one thing I can tell you, I will always be straight with you. I don't make empty promises and I don't do this job for me. I do it for you. If I'm honored to earn your vote on Tuesday, November 8th, I will work tirelessly to do all that I can to ensure that you always have a leader on your side. Um, and Paul, thank you so much for uh, hosting this today too. Okay, great, Senator Enchi. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, thank you so much for, for having us. It's an incredibly important. And I don't think uh, our communities and, and really our state has faced a more important time to have strong legislative representatives, especially in the state Senate. Uh, well, as we're seeing the federal government shift more focus onto the states, 
we have to make sure that we have voices in the legislature defending our rights, standing up for our communities, and being a voice in the room to make sure that our interests, our needs, and our beliefs are reflected at the table. That's why I ran for office in the first place, to be an upstate voice and to be an advocate for our communities, for my community, uh, where I live, where I've lived my whole life, and where I want to raise my future kids. Uh, this is a really important moment. I'm really proud to be the only pro-choice candidate in this race. I'm really proud to have an A rating from the League of Conservation Voters to protect our planet and to do right uh, by the CLCPA and to protect our environment uh, while my opponent has an F. And I'm also really proud to be the only candidate endorsed by law enforcement to keep our community safe. Uh, this is a moment where we have to we have to band together. We have to make sure that our areas and our communities have the representation that they need. I have promised from the beginning uh, to do everything that I can to advocate on behalf of our areas and to really make sure that we are delivering for our communities. It's why I passed 52 bills with wide bipartisan support. Uh, it's why we're able to show that we actually get things done, build bridges across party lines, end the division and actually get stuff done for the state of New York. Uh, and so I thank you for having this forum. I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, if I'm fortunate enough to earn the votes uh, of my neighbors uh, and our family members and our friends to fill another term, uh, I can I promise to be able to continue that work and that dedication and the energy, okay. bring the energy to deliver even more. Excellent. Okay, senators. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck to both of you, and uh, you will see what happens on November 8th. Thank you very uh, much. Keep in touch. Yeah.